Welcome to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center of Nassau County's Curator's Corner. I'm Thorin Tritter. I'm the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. This online program, as some of you know, is part of a regular series of short programs that we launched as a way to share information about particular objects and images in our collection at a time when our building was closed due to the coronavirus. I'm happy to say that our building is open. We do recommend people call up and make a reservation to schedule your visit just so we can assure separation in our gallery. Uh, but our building is open 10 to four, Monday through Friday. On Sunday, we ask you to make a reservation. Um, and regardless of the fact that we're open, I'm continuing with these online programs because I know of continuing concerns about the coronavirus. Before I start today's talk, let me encourage you to write any questions that come up during the talk in your chat, uh, sorry, not in the chat, in the Q&A. Um, Oh, uh, in the Q&A window and I'll try to respond at the end. Somebody is just sending me a note saying that uh, she's having trouble connecting to the Zoom link. Uh, the link keeps asking me questions. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm sorry, honey. I don't know. I'm sorry about that. Uh, you can always call Rachel at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center at 516-571-8040 and she can help you, I'm sure. We are going to move forward though because I know people have a schedule to keep. Today, I want to focus on a, an Art Deco clock, wall clock, that's part of our collection. And let me say a special thanks to Rob Fishman and his mother, Rosette Prevert Gerbosi, for giving this clock to us and making it part of our museum. This is a photo that shows the clock when it hung in the home of Rod Fishman, Rob Fishman before it came to our museum. Here is another view directly in front of the clock, and you can see the numbers and face with their sleek machined numbers, emblematic of the Art Deco design. You may also notice, however, that there's no manufacturer's name, no company name or logo shown on the face of the clock. Here's a, a zoomed in view that also shows you that there's, there's no markings to say who made this. A deep look inside the mechanism of the clock, however, reveals that it was made by a German clockmaker named Kienzel. You can see on the top here, one of the oldest clockmakers in Germany. And that's one of their, if you can make it out, Westminster Carillon clocks. The company was actually named for Jacob Kienzel, who was born in 1859 in Schweningen in Southwest Germany. Jacob started working in a clock factory at the age of 14, and then in 1883, he married the daughter of one of the master clockmakers in that city, a guy named Johannes Schlenker. Jacob and his new brother-in-law took over the father-in-law's watch business in 1883 and renamed it the firm as Schlenker Kienzel. They launched their firm just at a crucial moment, at a time when clockmaking was becoming industrialized moving from handmade clocks to mass-produced clocks in factories. Schlenker Kienzel produced over 100,000 clocks per year in the 1880s. In 1897, Schlenker left the firm and Kienzel became the sole proprietor. Production, however, did not slow. It continued to rise. Two years later, the company then known just under Kienzel was making over 200,000 clocks a year. And in 1903, with production at nearly 1 million clocks per year, Kienzel opened sales offices in London, Paris, and Milan. In 1919, Jacob Kienzel retired and passed the company on to his two sons. And over the next 20 years, they navigated through several mergers with other large German manufacturers, so that by 1939, Kienzel's company had over 6,000 employees, and was producing 5 million clocks and watches each year. The rise of Hitler and the Nazi party changed the clock company. Like almost all non-Jewish businesses in Germany, Kienzel came to embrace the Nazi ideology. During World War II, it relied on slave labor from Poland and other conquered areas to sustain production. It also secured contracts to provide watches and other timing instruments for the Axis military, including cockpit clocks for the Luftwaffe 
and wristwatches for the Wehrmacht. In the wake of the war, the company was reorganized, and although I haven't been able to find much about their denazification efforts or how its management changed, it, how its management changed, I'm sure it did go through a series of changes. It's still around today, largely known for its watches rather than wall clocks. I mentioned that our wall clock is a West, Westminster carillon named for the chime it plays, which is the same melody as used in the clock at the Palace of Westminster in London, which we know of as Big Ben. You might have to turn up the volume on your speakers to catch this. So I just give you a second to jack up your speakers for a second to hear the chime, but hopefully you'll be able to hear it when I click this button. Um, I, this, if you listen to Big Ben's chime and you can find some YouTube videos showing it, um, you'll hear it a kind of much kind of, I don't know, grittier, louder. This clock has a very subtle chime. It's, a, it's I think it's beautiful. Um, I think there is something interesting about the fact that this clock, a German clock, sold in Paris with a melody of London's Big Ben, that, that, that kind of, those three countries coming together. I think it's a sign of the cosmopolitan nature of Europe in the interwar years and the interconnectivity that existed. I see the clock as representing a certain optimistic outlook created by the economic links that were being and that were binding the different European countries together in the 1920s and 30s. Sadly, as we know, those economic ties were not strong enough to overcome the wave of ultranationalism that surged through Germany when Hitler came to power. So the clock with its connections to France, Germany, and England is representative of that brief historical moment when the flames of World War I had faded out and before Europe was swallowed again up in the war and the Nazi war machine. That said, we don't know exactly when our clock was made. Rosette Prevert Gerbosi was born in 1932 and remembers her father, Shama, bringing the clock home and mounting, mounting it in their dining room in their Paris apartment. There is some evidence that the clock may have been a few, built a few years earlier, before that, as one of the eight chime rods is notably lighter in color than the other seven steel rods, and that's what you can see here. The lighter rod created a lower pitch, but was something that Kienzel stopped manufacturing in the late 1920s. Of course, it's also possible that one of the chime rods was replaced at some point, so it's not a conclusive date marker. Regardless of the exact date, the clock was made sometime in the late 1920s or early 1930s. It was not a super expensive clock, but Rosette remembers that its rich, dark finish matched the mahogany furniture in her family's Parisian home, suggesting their financial success or at least level of comfort. Even if not the most expensive timepiece, the clock was a mark of the Prevert family's middle-class status and highlighted their inclusion in the modern economy with its focus on time and scheduling. Rosette's father was a furrier who had married his wife Dora in 1923. They moved to France from Eastern Europe in search of a better life. Their first child, Bernard, was born a year after they were married Rosette was then born eight years after that in 1932. Rosette's birth coincided with an uptick in her father's business, leading her mother to say that Rosette had brought them good luck. And she nicknamed Rosette her mazel or her luck. And in general, Rosette remembers that the family had a good life in Paris in the 1930s. She has photographs like this that show the family on vacation in Nice in 1937, enjoying the beach and the sun. Shama and Dora are on the right side of the photograph with five-year-old Rosette between them. Um, they're also then the, her 13-year-old brother, Bernard, with his savage tan, and Dora's sister, Suzanne, who joined them for the vacation. Rosette also recalls taking ballet and piano lessons while the family lived in a largely Jewish neighborhood in Paris, they felt interwoven with the larger French society. 
but just two years after this photograph was taken, Nazi Germany invaded Poland, marking the opening of World War II and eventually ripping Rosette's life apart. And here, let me add a bit more background about how the Holocaust unfolded in France. On May 10th, 1940, seven months after the Nazi invasion into Poland, Germany turned to the West and launched its attack against France. The speed of the Nazi attack left France reeling. France had felt it was impregnable because of the heavily defended Maginot Line, a set of entrenched military fortifications that had been built in the wake of World War I along the French-German border to prevent Germany from ever attacking France again. But the Nazi attack in 1940 largely skirted around that defensive line and swept into France through Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. Four days after launching the attack, the Nazis had the Netherlands ready to capitulate. In less than a month, Belgium, along with Denmark and Norway, a bit to the north, had fallen to the Nazis and they rushed into France. On June 14, 1940, just over a month after the Nazis launched their attack, the previously unthinkable happened and Paris fell to Germany. Two days later, after further German advances, the French premier, Paul Reynaud, resigned and Philippe Pétain, one of the French military heroes of World War I, stepped in as the new leader of France. On his first full day in office, he asked Germany for an armistice and called for France to surrender. The formal surrender came a week later on June 22, 1940. So in less than two months, you know, May 9th, France had not been attacked. By June 22nd, France had uh, surrendered. The armistice of June 22nd divided France into two, two zones. The northern portion of France, which was placed under German military occupation, and the south, which was left under nominal French sovereignty. The division of France meant that Germany didn't have to spend its resources administering and controlling the entire landmass of France, and instead it relied on the new French leader, Philippe Pétain, to do what it wanted. At least that was the plan. And Pétain and his Minister of State, Pierre Laval, took one more step on July 10th of 1940, when they successfully got the remaining members of the French National Assembly, that's the democratic leaders, elected leaders of France, they dissolved the Republic and established Vichy France as an authoritarian state with Philippe Pétain as its head. Vichy, the name Vichy comes from the centrally located city of Vichy that was made the new capital of that portion of France not occupied by the Germans. Today, I think many Americans have a kind of rosy image of the French underground fighting the Nazis, which certainly is true. But we often forget, perhaps because it offers a rather less attractive image of France, that both in occupied and in Vichy France, the governments embraced anti-Semitic policies and largely collaborated with the Nazis. Of course, the government in the occupied North embraced Nazi rule. It was occupied by the Nazis, but even in Vichy France, the part of France not under Nazi rule, the government collaborated with the Nazis. In the northern occupied section of France, the Nazis started the registration of Jews in September of 1940, including the Prévert family. But they relied heavily on the French police and the previously existing government structures to conduct that registration and to operate the newly commissioned concentration camp of Drancy, north of Paris, from eventually which 67,000 Jews were deported to Nazi death camps from. More disturbing to me is the actions of the Batin government in Vichy, France, which were not under Nazi rule. As soon it was, as it was established, Batin's government voluntarily took measures against those it identified as undesirable, including communists, gypsies, and Jews. Batin initially sought to distinguish between Jews who were native born to France and those who'd emigrated from Germany, Poland, or other countries, authorizing in October of 1940 the internment of any foreign Jew in France as a step towards their deportation to the Nazi camps. Then Pétain blurred the distinction of French or non-French Jews, passing laws to segregate all Jews and making them second-class citizens. They were blocked from serving in the government or in the military, blocked from a range of professions like teachers or doctors. By 1942, the Vichy police 
collaborated more actively with the Nazis in an action around Marseille that led to the arrest of more than 7,000 Jews, most of whom were sent to death camps. Research done later found that out of a pre-war Jewish population of 350,000, about 76,000, some 20% of the French Jews, were deported to Nazi concentration camps, including 25,000 Jews who were born in France. Of this number, less than 3,000 are thought to have survived. As you can see here, the deportation routes flowed from both Vichy and non-Vichy France. Both the percentage of Jews killed in France and the total number of Jews who were killed in France pale next to the number from a country like Poland, where 3 million Jews, 90% of the pre-war population were killed. But the difference was less because of French resistance to Nazi policies and more because of differences in the way the Nazis treated France and Poland. Rosette's family, the owner of the clock, like many French Jews, initially thought Vichy France would offer a safe haven. After the fall of France, Rosette's parents watched as the Nazis in Paris rounded up teenage boys and young men and put them to work in slave labor camps. Shama and Dora decided it wasn't safe for their son Bernard, who was 16 in 1940, to stay in the city. They sent him, along with a slightly older cousin, down to the south, down into Vichy France. And he then worked his way to the east and tried to get into Switzerland. But it, when he was refused entry there, he found a way to join the French resistance and spent the rest of the war fighting the Nazis and French authorities from within. Rosette's parents were initially hesitant to send Rosette away, given that she was only eight years old in 1940. This is a photo from 1939, so she's seven here, but the family thought she was too young to be sent away. Luckily, his, her father, with his skills as a furrier, was requisitioned by the Gestapo to start making coats for the German military as they prepared for the winter offensive into Russia. The fact that his work was needed gave Shama and Dora a sense of security, but it was a security that didn't last. By the spring of 1943, after surviving for three years under Nazi rule, Dora became increasingly worried as she saw more and more Jews disappear from neighboring apartments in the middle of the night, seeing them rounded up also and sent by the trains to the east. She decided it was no longer safe to keep Rosette in Paris. And so when their downstairs neighbors, who were Christian, said they were going to the south for the summer in 1943 to the small town of Piegu, Dora and Shama asked if Rosette could go with them. In July of 1943, Rosette, age 11, said goodbye to her parents and to her family apartment in Paris. The last words Rosette heard her mother say was, there goes my mazel, there goes my luck. Sadly, Dora was more right than she could have known Two weeks later, unbeknownst to Rosette, her parents were arrested and deported to Auschwitz. Rosette's last photograph of her parents is one that was taken in Paris in 1942 when Rosette was 10 years old. Rosette would not learn what happened to her parents until the war ended. Instead, three weeks after arriving in Piegu, she received a package from a neighbor in Paris that included toys, and a letter saying that her father had broken his arm and therefore her parents had been forced to go into hiding. Well aware, even at age 11, of the dangers her parents faced in Paris, she believed the letter and didn't think that her parents had been murdered. For the next year and a half, Rosette managed to survive, helped by a community the, that opposed Vichy and Nazi rule and that had strong links to the French underground. She finally learned what happened to her family in 1945 when her brother met her in Piegu. He told her that their parents had been arrested and deported, but they both initially held out hope that their parents would return now that the war was over. They didn't. Later, Rosette and Bernard found out that their parents had been murdered in the gas chambers at Auschwitz. Her parents' names would later be included in the Holocaust Memorial in Paris, the Memorial de la Shoah. Rosette, 13 years old, and Bernard, who was 21, returned to Paris, but found their old apartment had been emptied. 
One of the neighbors, however, came up, the neighbor who had been a good friend with Rosette's parents, and she said that Dora had given her various things to store before they were arrested, including some jewelry, some photographs, and the clock. Bernard and Rosette moved in temporarily with their father's brother and his family who had survived by hiding in a convent. Then in 1946, Rosette went to America to live with her mother's sister, Suzanne, who was in that earlier photo, who had gotten out of France in 1942 and made it through a rather complicated journey to New York. Traveling alone, as Bernard was forced to stay behind in France for a bit longer because of his service in the military, Rosette traveled for two weeks across the Atlantic on the SS Desirade, a merchant marine vessel. She docked on the west side of Manhattan on April 19th, 1946, and was met by her uncle and aunt. The, ship man, the ship's manifest lists her as 13 years old and eight months. Under race, which is the column all the way to the right in the highlighted portion, you can see that the word Hebrew was crossed out and she is instead listed as white. Perhaps this was due to a captain who had taken a shine to Rosette during the trip and thought this would be better for her, or perhaps because of some other reason, maybe because she had been hiding as a Christian in France during the war. Bernard came a year later. Rosette recalls watching him come down the gangplank of the SS John Erickson when it docked in New York with a big bundle under his arm. It was the clock. The clock remained in Bernard's home for most of the rest of his life and then stood in the dining room in the home of Rosette's son. Rosette said whenever she heard the chime, she got chills. On the one hand, the chimes, of course, and the clock reminded her of her childhood and the pre-war life of her family. The clock was one of the few tangible links to those years when her family was whole and her life was carefree. On the other hand, the clock was also a reminder of how that life had been ripped away. The clock, a physical reminder of her parents' murder by the Nazis. A reminder of the apartment that was stripped from them. A reminder of her own wartime memories, of the violence that she saw, even in the small town of Piegu. For me, the history of the clock is inspiring because it highlights the perseverance of Rosette and Bernard. Through a combination of their own skills, the help of others, and luck, they were able to survive. And they established new lives here in America, having families, children, grandchildren, and continuing their family history. But the clock stands as a physical bridge between the new lives they established and the old. Okay, I will stop there and encourage you to type in any questions you have in the Q&A window and I will try and respond. I also want to mention a couple of our other upcoming virtual programs. First to note that our museum is open and there's our hours and we have a temporary exhibit up, a sculpture exhibition. But in terms of virtual programming, this coming Sunday, January 10th at 1230 p.m., we're hosting Sunday with a Survivor program where Holocaust survivor Kathy Grease will give her testimony about how her life in Hungary, uh, how she managed to stay, to stay alive in Hungary, how she survived under Nazi and Soviet occupation. Next Wednesday, January 13th at noon, I hope you'll join us for our monthly virtual museum tour. We're fo focusing this month uh, on a gallery uh, tour that focuses on slippery slopes, exploring how the democratic government Germany collapsed and how the nation came to embrace mass murder. And one more program to mention next Thursday, January 14th at 7.30 p.m. We are working with the NAACP to mark the upcoming Martin Luther King Jr. weekend with a virtual screening of a documentary about the civil rights movement in North Hempstead. And we'll have a post-screening discussion with filmmaker Allen Ginsberg, civil rights activist Bernice Sims, and the program director for Nassau County's Office of Minority Affairs, Dexter Hedgepeth. You can find a full list of our upcoming programs and more information about these ones on our website at www.hmtcli.org under the events tab. I hope you'll also go to our website and click on the Give Now button to make a donation to support our virtual program. Okay, let me turn to your questions. 
Let me see what I can find here. Um, somebody mentions that the family picture taken in 1943 is not wearing the obligatory Star of David. Did they take it off for the occasion? I think, uh, I thought the photo was from 1942, and I believe that uh, they were not required to wear the the star until 1943. So even though under Nazi occupation the in Paris they hadn't required the star. I think that's the case, although it may well be, as you say, that they took it off just for the photograph. I'm not 100% sure. Um, how common was it for the Nazis to give special privileges to Jews in France who were in a position to help them, like Rosette's father, the furrier? Uh, I would just say, even though they kept, they didn't arrest the Prévert family, it's not like they really given special privileges. Uh, there was a process where the Nazis would arrest Jews and put them in camps and start taking them away, but uh, it wasn't done all at once in France and in Paris. And in this case, as is like uh, as is common actually throughout Europe, if there were Jews who were doing something the, of use to the Nazis, then those Jews often were able to survive longer. And this is seen in ghettos as well, where um, ghettos where there were factories that were producing materials, the people who were working were kept alive longer. At some point though, the Nazis wanted to kill them all. Um, why did Rosette's parents not, not see the danger in staying in Paris? I think, I, I don't know the answer. They, they thought that they were safe because of Shama's job there's a certain level of optimism that I think you see in many Jews during the Holocaust, thinking that it would work out, thinking that things would change for the better, and maybe that's what happened to Rosette's parents. There was obviously a lot of concern, which is why they sent their children, both their children away, even Rosette, who was, uh, you know, a very young girl. They did decide that it was not safe for them, but they stayed because they thought that maybe there was a chance things would get better. It, it's a sad Sad story for sure. Um, somebody asked about whether they, or Marais asked, were they rounded up in Le Grand Raffle of July of 1942? Uh, they apparently survived that they, they were, it was not until 1943 that Rosette's parents were rounded up. Do you know what happened to the apartment that Rosette grew up in and the other stuff that might have been in her apartment? You know, uh, Rob Fishman, who is a member of our board, who is Rosette's son, went with his family and with Rosette back to Paris a couple of years ago and tried to kind of trace the history of the clock and went to the building where the family had lived or the address where they had lived and they found the the address. I think the building had changed, but they found the address. Um, as to what happened to the contents of the, the rest of the contents of the apartment, it's not clear. It's possible that the family had been able to sell it or um, get rid of it on their own and they had asked their neighbor to store just those few key items that they didn't want to lose or else as is often the case the rest of the items would have just been put up for auction on the streets and neighbors would have purchased them or anybody wanted them would have purchased them at uh, pennies on the dollar or uh, centimes on the franc or whatever the appropriate um, currency is uh, but for sure there were just a few small items that the neighbor was was able to keep and held on for the entire war. Um, did Bernard document his experience in the French resistance? Yes, he did actually. Both Rosette and Bernard uh, were interviewed by the Shoah Foundation and have their testimonies recorded. And Bernard's, I, I did not listen to Bernard's, but apparently Rosette told me that his describes quite a bit about his work in the French underground and is quite impressive to hear what he was doing. Okay, thanks very much for tuning in. As usual, I'm grateful for you being here and your support of the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center. And I look forward to seeing you at some of our other programs soon. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye.